speaking right after our students perform. It's uh, probably a little bit of a letdown, but thank you to Accolade. Thanks to our, uh, our student athletes and uh, our leadership. Um, today we're going to hear from former President Rod Smith, who served as president of Southern Virginia for seven years. President Smith led the university during one of the most challenging and exciting periods in its history, including a period of significant student body growth, during which time the enrollment topped 800 students. Also during his time as president, he led the university through the very challenging process of earning regional accreditation, 
an ambitious and somewhat risky proposition for a young college like we were. Shortly after receiving regional accreditation, he oversaw the successful petition for membership in the NCAA and the Capital Athletic Conference. Always an advocate for students, he established several scholarships, including the Bacamo Scholarship, honoring his mother-in-law. He worked tirelessly to raise funds to operate and to improve our campus, including renovations to the Stoddard Center, the arena, the Kimball Student Center, the fields, and the construction of the lofts. President Smith is a nationally known constitutional scholar and has published extensively, including a recently published book on James Madison. He now serves as the director of the Center for Constitutional Studies at Utah Valley University. Previously, he was the director of the Sports Law and Business Program at Arizona State University and a distinguished professor of law at the Thomas Jefferson School of Law in San Diego, California. In addition to these noteworthy achievements, Dr. Smith was known as a friend to everyone, and is known. He was often seen walking around campus in his signature Chuck Taylor Converse shoes, which he wore in the school's color of green, and which was a tradition that many students emulated, until we changed to crimson. <laughs> I've known Rod Smith personally for many years. He was president when I started my employment here at the university. In fact, I still remember him extending an offer of employment to me and to my wife over lunch at Don Tequila. I know Rod Smith to be a great man, even a giant among men. Nonetheless, you won't find a man who demonstrates more humility, loyalty, or commitment to faith and to family. Following his remarks, we will sing Love One Another. The closing prayer will be offered by SVSA freshman class vice president, Anahi Hansen. Please join me in welcoming one of the great leaders in this university's history and my friend, former president, Rodney K. Smith. I'm not really accustomed to using PowerPoint. I, I'm accustomed to Socratic. But I'm going to give it a shot if I can make this work. How about that? <laughs> All things are possible. I want to begin by thanking Accolade. And I want you all to know, everywhere I go, I feel no shame. I am a knight. Once a night, always a night. But today, we're going to talk about uh, Brett, a real giant of a man, James Madison. But he was a strange giant because he was only five foot four inches tall. And he was frail. And you could hardly hear him when he spoke. He spoke so quietly. And yet... Jefferson said, not only was he the greatest intellect of their generation, he was also the most eloquent when it came to persuasion. Now, some of you take heart. He was 42 before he got married. <laughs> when he finally fell in love, here he is, five foot four inches, frail. And he marries Dolly Payne Todd, who is five foot eight inches tall, buxom, that's as far as we go, and she uh, was the life of the party, and he was introverted, and there was seven, he, she was 17 years younger. I have another book that's coming out later this year, the first of next year. It's entitled James and Dolly Madison, an unlikely love story that saved America. 
you'll just have to wait on that one. Maybe I'll come back next year and talk about it. <laughs> so, this was a giant of man, but he was our greatest lawmaker. Let's see. This one? Yeah. Who did this? Who largely wrote Washington's first inaugural address, then wrote the response of the House of Representatives to Washington's address, and then wrote the president's response to Congress? (laughs) Who? James James Madison. Okay. Who was effectively Washington's first prime minister during his first two years in Congress? Madison. You're going to have to warm up a little bit, folks. Uh, Who was the Secretary of State who helped orchestrate, actually without whom we would have no Louisiana Purchase? Madison. And then, as president, laid the groundwork for acquiring Florida and millions of acres in the southern states. Madison. Very good. You're getting... Which president before Lincoln offered a viable solution to end slavery without war? Madison. And which two presidential candidates picked up on Madison's ideas, this is a trick question, and also offered the nation a way to end slavery without war? They picked up on Madison's solution. Who were they? Who was the first? 1844. A presidential candidate. Anybody guess? Joseph Smith. Very good. And then who was the next presidential candidate to pick up on Madison's solution? Abraham Lincoln. Very good. Who did Charles Ingersoll refer to as the father of the Constitution? Madison. You got it. Very good. Who is the primary author of the Bill of Rights, including the First Amendment? Madison. Uh, Who, which president and first lady, led our nation through the second and final war of independence into what is referred to as our nation's only era of good feelings? James and Dolly. And then uh, who served as a first lady for four terms? Well, that's right, but it's Dolly. When things got slow, incidentally... If they were a party and she could, she could throw a party like no other, she would bring all of the parties together. They would all come together and uh, she would help with, with the aid of her, her husband and would go about and help bring about all this legislative compromise. Wouldn't you love to have that, Ben? Yeah, we need it. it so, uh, but when things got slow, she would nod at James. He knew what she meant. She would immediately get up and run around the table. He'd jump up and jump on her back, and they would run around the table, and everything was light and airy again. (laughs) James and Dolly Madison. Uh, Whose death was commemorated with the largest parade in history to that date in Washington? Which, which Madison? Dolly. Very good. Terrific. Madison's teachers. Donald Robertson was a minister te- and a teacher schooled in the Scottish Enlightenment from the University of uh, Edinburgh. Madison, at eight, age 12, went to teach to, uh, as one of his 30 students. He emphasized precision in thinking and writing. He said Madison could not write, so he spent his first year just teaching him to write. Then he proceeded to Cicero, Horace, Justinian, Tacitus, Virgil. Maybe it sounds familiar to some of you. And uh, he uh, read the great works, Professor Armstrong, in... What languages? Greek and Latin, Latin, of course. Why? That's the only right way to do it. it. Very good. And, of course, he uh, studied Locke, Milton, Montaigne, Montesquieu, Smith. Madison said of Donald Robertson, all that I have been in life I owe largely to Robertson. I wish you could come, students. Seven of my children 
are SVU nights. We do not gather. We do not gather as a family when they do not talk of the faculty. I had one come up to me and say, do do you remember me? We talk about you every time they get together. Ask, listen to the people your friends talk about. You have something unique. In fact, Southern Virginia University is closer to the College of New Jersey where Madison went to school than any other college in the United States of America. The only close competitor would be Wheaton. Because you combine the greatest of thinking in a liberal tradition with the spirit and religion. And he, he did. One of the things, though, you need to realize is they had a devotional every day. Wouldn't you love that? Uh, John Witherspoon was another great teacher, graduated from the University of Edinburgh, another Scottish Enlightenment person, only clergyman to sign the Do- Declaration of Independence. His influence, 300 students, 300 students at the College of New Jersey. 37 judges, three on the United States Supreme Court, he taught. Nine cabinet members, 21 U.S. senators, 39 members of the United States House of Representatives, 12 governors. Remember, there weren't nearly as many states. One vice president, Aaron Burr. He also introduced James and Dolly, but that's for next time. And, of course, one president, Madison. President John Adams said this of Witherspoon. He is as high a son of liberty as any man in America. Well, he goes through, he finishes this wonderful experience at uh, the College of New Jersey. He decides he's going to do it in two years. So he gets four hours of sleep a night, and that becomes his habit thereafter. So he's writing to his friend, William Bradford, a classmate, a friend. They decide, uh, Madison said, oh, we can't be a lawyer because there are already too many lawyers. (laughs) Sounds kind of familiar. Uh, 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 Not a clergyman, but Madison wrote that, quote, A watchful eye must be kept on ourselves, lest we are building ideal monuments of renown and bliss here, while we neglect to have our names enrolled in the annals of heaven. Wise. He was a delegate to the Virginia Constitution. He was young at this point in time, and he was vexed. What vexed him most? What he'd come back from the College of New Jersey, and he had discovered that. Baptist ministers were being placed in jail unless they got a license to preach. Violated their conscience. He said it vexed him more than anything else. He is our nation's greatest lawmaker, and the most important law to him was the one that protected the right of religious conscience. He offers an amendment. He he is too young, too new, too unseasoned. Yes, Representative Klein, you're living some of that yourself right now. So he has to get Patrick Henry, who later becomes his nemesis, to introduce his amendment. But he wants to amend. What they wanted was toleration. He said toleration will not do. Mason wanted toleration. Madison wanted robust liberty. And so here's what he said, that religion or duty which we owe to our creator. The right of conscience is a duty-based right. And the manner of discharging it being under the direction of reason and conviction only, not of violence or compulsion. All men are entitled to the full and free exercise. We'll see free exercise again of it according to the dictates of conscience. And therefore, no man or class of men ought, on account of religion, to be invested with particular emoluments. That becomes the establishment portion of the religious liberty provision in the First Amendment. 
or privileges, nor subject to any penalties or disabilities, when could government regulate religious conscience? Only in two instances, when the equal liberty of conscience was violated and the existence of the state was manifestly endangered. Otherwise, no just government would touch the right of conscience. Well, this permeates the rest of his thanking, the memorial and remonstrance. Patrick Henry now introduces a bill establishing a provision for teachers of the Christian religion. Madison opposes it, arguing all religions should be treated equally. For him, think about this. God, whatever God's religion is, Christian or otherwise, needs nothing more than a level playing field, does not need the preference of the state, just needs a level playing field. He then becomes, I'm jumping lots of history, you can see it in my book, it's available on Amazon, that's my only advertisement. If you get it, Leave a comment, even if it's negative. I read them. Uh, and I learn, from the, I learn from the ones that criticize. Okay, Bill of Rights. Madison is running for Congress, just like Ben did. He's running. But you know, Ben, here's what he did. He, was, he had to be the pro-tax candidate and the anti-Bill of Rights, and he got to run... This small man who had little charisma against James Monroe, who had all of the above. The district had been gerrymandered by uh, Patrick Henry. It seemed hopeless. Jefferson ultimately persuades him to uh, write the Bill of Rights. Why was he opposed? Because he believed that we might have left out some rights, and secondly, and more importantly, that whenever you use language, the majority could use it to restrict religion. But he finally decides to do it, so who does he, who ends up writing it, really? He does. He introduces the entire Bill of Rights, he pushes it through, then the Senate, you won't believe this one again, Ben. What happened was they have a conference committee. The Senate version is really different from the House version. Six of the people in the conference committee were College of New Jersey graduates. In three days, they had it together. And Madison really ends up writing this. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Both of them are participial phrases. The First Amendment is a beautiful instance of antithesis. Now, here's what Madison, when he was looking to go, when he was wondering about what he was going to do with the rest of his life, said, I'll just go back to SV, I mean, to the College of New Jersey. So he goes back to the College of New Jersey. Does anyone know what he studied? Very good. Hebrew. Very good. What a group. What a group. He, he goes back to study Hebrew. This is a terrific, the cadence of it, everything. This is a, like a Hebraic antithesis. On the one side, you've got no law respecting a participial, a verb form, or prohibiting. So on the one hand, here's what government can't do to help religion, and here's what they must do to protect it. There's much more of this in the book. Then afterwards, it's, it, it, it's adopted. They adopt it, and uh, it's ratified, and Jefferson is circulating the notice of ratification to the states. The very same month... Madison writes a wondrous essay on, entitled An Essay on Property. 
in which he said, we have rights in property. If I take Bill's house, I have to what? The government can take you if it has a just reason and gives you just compensation. If it has a reason and gives you compensation. What if it takes your right to speak? How do they compensate you? He goes through all it. So you have a right in property, but you also have property in rights. If we take your right to speak about the things that are most important to you, we've taken both property and a right. But how do we compensate you? The only way you could do it is to take everybody else's right equally. Said the same thing of press. Said the same thing of assembly. Said the same thing about petition of government. But as to the right of conscience, he said, that is the most sacred of all property. Why would that be? What's, what's he getting at? Why is this right of religious conscience the most sacred? Brett, so, see, this is a time. I really should be calling on the faculty, shouldn't I? I uh, you get the next one, John. Okay, so, what is it, what is special about the right of conscience? I mentioned earlier it was a duty-based right. Who's the duty to? Duty to God. Duty to God. It's not about licentiousness. It's about a duty to God. The rest of the world thinks this is silly. But I made a covenant not to do certain things. Some, I gave up the thing I, the dish I loved above all others, coffee. But for me, it's a duty. The rest of the world would laugh at that. Well, why can't we regulate his, that in the general good? Because to do so would violate my relationship to God. Most particularly, it would take my soul. You cannot compensate a person for the taking of their soul. Madison knew that. My greatest fear is that we're forgetting that. And we're forgetting that about all of our rights. I will close with this. Why did I start writing? I wrote an article about that, and I don't generally say this in my remarks, but why do... Uh, why did I write about... I wrote about Madison, wrote about the... Thank you. And give my love to Madison. The other Madison. Uh, that you... I wrote about him because I, I did it for my dissertation. I went to, for me, the most sacred place, the temple... I prayed I didn't want to put it out if it wasn't something appropriate. I got a wonderful witness. I will, I believe that James Madison is to the temporal restoration what Joseph Smith was to the spiritual. Put simply, I love being a knight, but I love Madison even more. Thank God for James Madison, and thank you all.